go to Matthew chapter 26. Let's read Matthew chapter 26. We'll start reading in verse 26. Look what it says. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And notice that verse there. This is my blood of the New Testament. All right, the blood of the New Testament. And what I want to preach tonight, I'm going to preach a message. The title of it is called The Hypocrisy of Rejecting Replacement Theology. Now, one of the things that we get regularly slammed for around here is our teaching of replacement theology. I saw just another video this week that a church put out, a well-known uh, church, against replacement theology. And I am just disgusted by the misrepresentation that is out there when it comes to replacement theology. And you know what? I, I try hard, and I'm sure I have failed. I try hard when I am refuting another position, another religion or something, I try hard to represent them accurately. I really do. I'll listen to some of their sermons or I'll, I'll read their doctrinal statements. I've even called people up before. I've called them up and say, listen, I want to, I'm, I'm plan I mean, I've got friends like that that are on other belief systems and I'll call them up and say, hey, I want to make sure I'm representing you right in this. I'm going to say this. Is this what you guys actually believe? Is this what you actually teach? I will call these people up. I'm not afraid to do it if they're, if they're willing to take my call. And I am so sick of this, this cowardly Sam Gipp type of you know, refuting of theology. You have these Sam Gipps who come in and just make up these stupid straw men. I mean, just misrepresent in the worst ways that you can imagine. When Keith Gomez had Sam Gipp come out to do that anti-Anderson conference, I called Keith Gomez up and I warned him about having Sam Gipp. I warned him about his heresies. I told him, Sam, I know Sam Gipp's material. I said, I'm fine with you trying to defend your church's position on these things, but I don't think he represents what you teach in your church and what you believe. And I said, and I understand you try, want to go after Pastor Anderson and what he's teaching, but I said, I know Sam Gipp's material. He doesn't represent it accurately. While he is, the, I am at the conference, and Sam Gipp is just up there lying about what Pastor Anderson teaches. Just, I mean, lie after lie after lie. I'm telling Keith Gomez, this is not right. He was right. He said that nobody teaches this. I've never heard anybody, you know, teach what he's saying. He's lying about this. I'm giving him all these examples, and I'm like, you know, I will. I really want to just talk to you guys and show you what the Bible says. But you know, Sam, you know, Sam Gipp out of obligation came and he couldn't even let me say anything he just ran off keith gomez did not show up for that conference for whatever reason and it was just a total waste of time i wasted the three days that i was there just listening to just garbage you know theology listening to a guy try to refute replacement theology but then he didn't ever represent it accurately that is just that is what cowards do that is what people do who are wrong that is what people do who have no answers if i if you ask me a question that i don't have the answer for you know what i what people tend to do in those situations is they answer a different question that's what they do you know was it you you know did you steal from that gas station I never went into Casey's, you know, but you're talking about the shell gas station. We try to answer another question. You know, I've never done any, you know, we, I, I never did anything to hurt anybody. I never killed anybody. I didn't ask you to kill anybody. I asked if you stole. Okay, that's what people often do to try to deflect, to try to dodge the answer. And what I want to do today in this message, I want to show what replacement theology is. Okay, and there's other versions of it out there, folks. There is a Catholic form of replacement theology that's garbage, that we reject, that I do not believe. And that's usually what Baptists try to refute, is the Catholic version of replacement theology. And I, I don't subscribe to that, not one bit. Okay, and what I, want, what I want to hear one person do, and I've yet to do it, I want to hear one person get up and accurately represent our side and then try to refute it and even if i don't agree with what they'd come up with i can at least have respect for them as an opponent because you know what while we disagree 
at least they're not stinking liars. And I've had enough of the Bill Grady's, the Sam Gipps, all these Ruckmanites that just lie about what we teach. And I'm sick of all the brain-dead, spineless Baptists that can't refute it themselves because they, they don't know enough Bible. And they bring these weasels into their church to try to refute what we teach. I think that's garbage. I've had enough of it. I'm going to give them something that they need to try to refute. And I, I'd, I'd love to see what happens. And even if we don't agree, I can at least respect them. And I've told my friends, they're on the other side, you can preach, you know, you can defend pre-trib, you can defend your pro-juice stuff, and you can even name my name and preach a whole message entitled Tommy McMurtry Refuted. Just, I ask one thing, accurately represent my position. If you can do that, we'll still be friends, and I can at least respect you. And I have no respect for these people that are out there today trying to refute it. So this... this Replacement theology that we teach, this is one of the most attacked doctrines in Baptist churches today, and it's obviously one of the most misunderstood doctrines. And I believe it's willful ignorant of Baptists on this subject that's left them vulnerable to some very serious heresies that have crept into Baptist churches. Because they are rejecting this, there are certain thing, aspects of replacement theology where they, that they've rejected. They've allowed the leaven of Zionism to come in, and it's, it's messed up their salvation. You've got guys teaching dispensational salvation. You've got guys teaching faith plus works in the Old Testament, faith plus works in the tribulation. That's heresy. That shows these people they've lost the whole concept of salvation and why Jesus even had to come to earth. It's clear that they've missed that. They've lost it. There's preachers that are still preaching a right gospel now, but they are wide open. They are vulnerable to the heresies of dispensationalism. And we're seeing good churches that are just getting really caught up deep into dispensationalism in an attempt to defend these pet doctrines that Baptists have gotten on board with of the pre-trib rapture and being Zionist. And it is, it is killing churches, and these people, I mean, it's, it's sad what's going on. And so most of what, I mean, literally almost everything I'm going to teach tonight is replacement theology, and most Baptists believe it. All right? And it's actually hypocritical when they teach the stuff that I'm teaching tonight. And I'm going to show you how hypocritical it is to teach what most Baptists teach, yet deny replacement theology. And so, it, you know, it is Zionism, too, that's rocked God's people to sleep, you know, through the teachings of the pre-trib rapture. That's why their churches are dead right now. Their churches aren't, they're not toughening their people up, getting them ready for persecution and for tribulation. No, they have lulled these people to sleep. They've made them think they're in the Laodicean lukewarm church age. And pastors, instead of figuring out what's wrong, there's like, we're in the Laodicean church age. There's no such thing as a Laodicean church age. That's dispensational garbage. Right there. Baptists, they've been brainwashed through the use of extra biblical terms that have been used, you know, uh, they've been used to keep them from biblical terms that would ultimately lead people to the truth. For example, the rapture of the church. I keep hearing some of these guys say that, the rapture of the church. Listen, when you hear a guy say the rapture of the church, I need, just mark it down. That person is a copycat and they have not studied that for themselves. What is the rapture of the church? Or it's like the rapture of the church. Why do they say the rapture of the church? You want to know why they say the rapture of the church? Here's why they have to say the rapture of the church. Because if they just say, let's say, uh, here's a biblical term. How about the gathering of the elect? Oh, no, you know, the gathering elect, that's different in Matthew 24. Isn't that what it's called in Matthew 24? He will send his angels to gather his elect. If they use the word gathering, we've got a big problem. Because 2 Thessalonians 2, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind nor be troubled. He goes on to talk about the rapture, how it's not going to come until that man of sin be revealed. But the thing is, if we would call it the gathering or the gathering of the elect, people would have associated Matthew 24 with 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1 Thessalonians 4, they might assume that being gathered together and caught up together with them in the clouds might be the same event. And it is the same event. So what do they say? The rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. Why? 
because the church is not Israel. It's what they're always trying to separate the people of God. So they use that term. But no, it's the rapture of the saved. It's the rapture of the believers. All believers are going up in the rapture. It's clear when you hear those who try to use refute replacement theology, that it's so clear that they've not even looked into the doctrine. And they all they do is they just refute a perverted form of it, like the Catholic version of it. And there are some other weird versions of it out there that they might have their fun with just to look like they're you know, good at refuting these things. But, you know, common statements that I hear opponents say that just proves their ignorance, all right, that just proves they are not qualified to even try to speak against what we teach because they have no idea is when they say things like, you know, the replacement theology crowd, they believe that God has pro broken his promise to Israel. That's what they say all the time. They believe God broke his promise to Israel. No, the Zionists have changed God's promise to Israel is what's happened. And I'll show you that they have changed the promise of God from what it clearly says in the Bible. They have changed the meaning of it. They have ch literally changed God's promise to something else. No, I believe that God kept his promise to Israel Amen. or is going to keep his promise to Israel. I absolutely believe that. I just believe these bozos have changed God's promise to Israel to fit their doctrine. They say that we look at the Jews with condescension the way the Jews used to look at us. That's what they say. But no, actually, we believe they can be saved exactly like us if they'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We actually believe there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. We believe that God is not a respecter of persons. That's what we believe. So, now, we do have a huge problem with the religion because it's an antichrist. They say that replacement theology, it's the heretical idea that God has abandoned the Jews and replaced them with the church. I'd like to hear them get, catch one of us say that, that God abandoned the Jews and replaced them with the church. That's what they say that we believe. But yet, they're, they're not going to find any, anybody saying that. They're not going to find me saying that, that God abandoned the Jews. See, how, did God, let me, how, how, did, how could God have abandoned the Jews when God sent Jesus to die for their sins? He sent a deliverer, all right? And we'll get more into that later. I, I've never said that. God did not abandon the Jews and replace them with the Gentiles. Jews can be saved just like us. I, I, I don't know where that comes from. That's called a straw man. That's called, I don't have an answer for what they teach. I don't have an answer, you know, for if ye be Christ, ye are Abraham's seed. So I'm just going to make this up and say that, you know, they didn't go broke his promise to Israel. Nope, I think you're an idiot. I, I, I think you're scared of the real argument. But we don't. We were grafted into the same olive tree that they were a part of. Look at it, look, go over to Romans chapter 11. Their favorite chapter. And it's high time we take this chapter away from them because this chapter supports everything about replacement theology. This, I mean, we, own, we should own this chapter. But unfortunately, they only like all Israel shall be saved instead of the rest of it. I'm just going to tell you right now, I like all Israel shall be saved too. All right? But I also uh, take it in context, and I know what it actually means. It says in Romans 11, verse 17, it says, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Now, what's this saying here? I heard a guy say the other day, you know, they think that Israel, you know, they weren't able to maintain what, you know, God had given them, but for some reason, us Gentiles are able to. I've never heard anybody say that either. I love these things that we all teach that I've never heard anybody teach before. It's like, well, I'm glad you let me know I'm teaching that, you know, because am I missing something here? No, nobody teaches that. These are straw man arguments. Listen, Jesus Christ had to come to this earth because the Jews, they could not keep the law. God did choose a special people. God did cho choose Abraham. God chose the people of Israel. God gave them special protection. God gave them his law. 
God blessed them even though they kept sinning and turning from Him. God kept you know, you know, giving them chance after chance after chance. But you know what? They couldn't keep the law. And so you know what God did for the Jews? God sent them a deliverer. He sent them a Savior. He sent them Jesus Christ to die on the cross for their sins. He already sent the deliverer. They're like, all Israel shall be saved. For out of Zion will come a deliverer that shall turn ungodliness away from Jacob as if it's something that's going to happen in the future. No, when it said that, it was quoting the Old Testament. The deliverer already came. Look at Acts chapter 3. Turn over to Acts chapter 3 and verse 25. I've never heard any of them take that passage. In Romans chapter 11, when it says, Out of Zion will come a deliverer that will turn ungodliness away from Jacob. Yes, future tense words, but that's because it's quoting Old Testament. All right? But look what it says in Acts chapter 3, verse 25. It says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now let me ask you, is he talking in the future or in the present, right? Or in the past right here? He said he already did it. Jesus came. Listen, the deliverer came. Jesus Christ came to this earth and he turned ungodliness away from Jacob when he died on the cross and when he paid for their sins. All right, but here's the thing. How do you get in on that? All right, because not everybody in Israel followed Jesus Christ, did they? You know why? Because they are not all Israel that are of Israel. All right, they that are of the flesh are not the children of God. We, turns out the way that you get that godly, ungodly is turned away, it's not by whether or not you are of Israel. Uh, a child of Abraham by the law, but by faith. We'll, we'll say more about that in a little bit, but I'm just here today to tell you, all right, I need to let these dispensationalists know, all right, these Zionists know that the deliverer already came. Jesus Christ already came. He turned ungodliness away when he died and he paid for their sins. Well, you know, they're still ungodly. Well, yeah, and so are you. But did he not take our sins from us? When we got saved, did he not cleanse us from our sins? Did we not receive imputed righteousness? Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, we, we got all those things when we trusted in Jesus Christ. And you know what? Israel will get those things when they trust in Christ, if they are of Israel physically, just like us. So I don't want to get ahead of myself on that, but... Listen, we were, we were grafted into the same olive tree that they were a part of. We didn't, we didn't come along and replace them like we kicked them out. No. Listen, if they would believe on Christ, they'd still be in that same olive tree. Okay? We did not replace them. We joined with them. Okay? And I'm going to show you the Scriptures on this here in a little bit. Jesus, when He came, He did come for the Jews. But you know what? He didn't come for the Jews only. He ended up coming for us too. You say, well, why is that? Those promises were to the Jews. Well, he had to extend it to us because of the fact that the Jews, like every other person in the world, every other nation in the world, were sinners. And so you know what he had to do? He actually had to break them off. He had to conclude them all in unbelief so he could have mercy upon all. Do you realize the fact that God broke those branches off concluding them in unbelief, he put them in the exact same boat that we were in as just sinners needing a Savior. And so they can be saved just like we are saved. We didn't replace them, folks. All right? We did not replace them. We, or we didn't replace the, one, you know, the, one, the real ones in the Old Testament. We didn't replace Abraham. We didn't replace Moses. Moses. We didn't replace any of those believing Jews and the thing is, even a Zionist would tell you, even a dispensationalist would tell you, people like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they're not going to be in heaven. They're not going to inherit the land. Even they today would tell you that the unsaved ones aren't going to inherit the land. It's only those who are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, this one clown in this video, he is just like, you know, a God that's not able to deliver his own people isn't, is, you know, is quite a small God. He delivered his people when he took away their sins on the cross. It's not his fault that some rejected. Okay? He did what needed to be done. These people, they need to go back to basic kindergarten in doctrine. 
is what they need to do. But unfortunately, they're trying to look smart. You've got a bunch of just these rednecks who sound dumb. They look dumb, but they want to sound smart by going and reading Larkin, Darby, and Schofield and coming up with this stupid dispensational theology. Dispensational is probably the biggest word that they know. They want to be able to use words like that. And so they come up with all this stuff so they can you know, look like they're smart when they're idiots and they don't even realize that they need to go back to kindergarten and learn a concept of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, the New Testament replaced the Old Testament. So I'll show you more on that in a, in a little bit. But he, when that guy, I, I'm, listen, I'm listening to this guy when he's like, a God that is not able to deliver his own people is a very small God. And I'm thinking, I, I, just, I wanted to take this guy and I would just wanted to smack him over the head with John, or Romans 9.6. What does it say? Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall I see be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. I want to hear one of these guys expound on this passage. Amen. They that are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. And I got bad news for you. Galatians says, and now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. That's, that's real simple. That's so simple, I can get Lana up here and teach that. These buzzards. Listen, the truth is, people who reject replacement theology, they need to go back to kindergarten, doctrinally speaking. And we've got to we've got to just we've got to reject this stuff. They need to just man up and admit that you know what, I wanted to look smart and I skipped addition and subtraction so I can go right into algebra. And you know what, algebra is so confusing. Most people look at all that gibberish on there and they can't tell if it's right or wrong either. You know, it's funny how an algebra equation it looks like one of Robert Breaker's uh, charts proving a pre-trib rapture, doesn't it? Isn't that interesting? What do most people do when they look at a Robert Breaker chart? Looks like he knows what he's talking about. I'll go along with him. All right? But somebody who's actually done some studying is going to figure it out and see all the mistakes that are in there. And you know what? What these people need to do, they just need to go back to basic kindergarten. All right? So what is... I've got three questions I'm going to answer tonight. All right? And I'm going to not answer them in this order, in the opposite order of what I'm going to say. So first off, what is replacement theology? Second off, what was replaced? Third, why did what was replaced need replacing? Now, that's the question I want to answer first. Because what I'm about to tell you here, most Baptists are going to agree with this. Most Baptists teach this. Most Baptists are teaching, singing, replacement theology every week, and they don't even know it. All right? So why did what was replaced need replacing? Look what it says in Romans chapter 8. In verse 1. It says, Now there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay? Why did what was replaced need replacing? I'll tell you why. Because flesh is sinful. And you know what? I, I'll probably get called anti-Semitic for saying this, all right? I'm probably going to get, I, I, I've been called anti-Semitic for saying things way less extreme than what I'm about to say right now, all right? I'll probably get banned from YouTube for what I am about to say. But I'm sorry, it's just a fact. You know what? The Jews are made out of the same flesh that we're made out of. All right? Now, I know, I know we're supposed to put them up on a pedestal and higher than the rest of us. All right? I get that. But you know what? They're not. We're all of one blood. Okay? And you know what? Their flesh was weak too. All right, the law could not save them because it was weak because their flesh too. Their flesh was, their flesh was bad. Their flesh was sinful. Okay? 
and they needed a savior. They could not keep the law. The Jews had the same problem that we had, a sin problem. Turn over to Romans chapter 2. Now, when you go back and you look in the Bible, we see the Gentiles did some pretty bad things, but did you know throughout the Israel's history, you see them participating in pretty much every abomination that the heathen participated in. And so you know what God did? God brought all the judgments on them that he brought on the heathen. God made them suffer the same way the heathen did. Why? Because they were doing the same things that the heathen did. Look what it says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Why is it, keep, why is it the same thing for both? Why? Because, for there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law, all right, that's those Gentiles who didn't receive the law, shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Now, what's going to happen to a Jew if he gets judged by the law? He's going to perish, isn't he? Why? Because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See how, isn't it interesting how God ends up treating both Jew and Gentile the same way? Now, why is Paul even talking about this? Why is he even bringing this up? He's just showing that, you know what? At the end of the day, we're all sinners. Yeah, there's groups out there that are worse than others, but you know what? We're all sinners. And those who sin in the law, they're going to be judged by the law. It means they're going to perish. If they, are, uh, if they die without the law, they are, going to, they are going to perish because of their sin and their wickedness. And we see that it's the same fate Jew and Gentile, while God did give special favor to the Jews, while God gave them special blessing, he, to them were committed the oracles of God. We see that they failed. Why? Because of their flesh. They did all the same things that the Gentiles did. They did all the same wickedness. But you know what God did? God loved those Jews. God cared about them. God promised them a deliver. God promised them that he would give them these things. God promised that one day they would inherit the land. He gave them all these wonderful promises. And he said, I'm going to give these things to you. But you know what? The only way that promise could be fulfilled is that a deliverer came. And a deliverer came and his name was Jesus Christ. And he took away their sins. Because unlike Sam Gipp teaches that, you know, what did the Gentiles need delivered from? It was the Jews who were always in bondage to the Gentiles. No, their problem wasn't the Gentiles. God proved over and over again he could defeat every one of their enemies. Over and over again. What was the Jews' problem? The problem was sin. The problem was they did all the same sins that the Gentiles did. They served all the false gods that the Gentiles served, and, but yet God loved them, and he sent his son to pay for their sins. And you know, it just happens to be that when God died for the sins of the Jews, he died for the sins of the whole world. Because you know what? It turns out he didn't just love the Jews. It turns out for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It turns out that, hey, since there's no respect of persons with God, since the Jews sinned, just like the Gentiles, and I died for their sins, it works for the Gentiles too. I'll save them just like I'll save the Gentiles. So we see why what was replaced need replacing was because the Jews had a sin problem. The law was not going to get them to heaven. There needed to be a new way. There needed to be a new covenant. There needed to be something better, is what the Bible calls it. And it was called the New Testament. And that New Testament was the blood of Jesus Christ that was promised in Jeremiah. It was Jesus Christ. So because the Jews had that sin problem, God had to send a deliverer or a Messiah. And it's the same one that he sent for us. So we already read Romans chapter 11. Out of Zion shall come a deliverer. Well, look what it says in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 16. Because everybody loves that verse. You know, all Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be saved. Well, once again, is that, a, is that a how or is it a when? Okay, I already proved that everything there is referring to the past. It's just quoting Old Testament. Okay? And I heard this guy the other day trying to refute replacement theology, and he used this verse, and I'm thinking, well, you found that? You know this verse? How are you not on our side? All right? I never found this verse until I've been in replacement theology for over a year. And I'm thinking, man, this guy knows this verse, and he's not replacement theology? Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 16. 
They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded. World without end. There it is right there. It's for Israel. All Israel shall be saved. This is something out there in the future. Look at verse 22 of Isaiah 45. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Hey, is that verse familiar? I think, believe I remember reading that in the New Testament. That was quoting the Old Testament, folks. I, hey, what was coming for Israel was not just for Israel. It was for the whole world. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and should glory. Do you all see that, folks? This, what was promised to Israel, ended up being for the whole world. Amen. And we see yet they're taking these verses and acting like it's something in the future. Folks, it already happened. We are in this age right now. Israel, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting a little excited, folks, and fired up, but I'm just, I'm sick of this, folks. Replacement theology, I mean, that, that's just, this is the Bible, man. It's the New Testament. I don't want to go back to the law. I don't want to go try to work my way to heaven. All right, this is, this, is, this is Christianity that we're talking about here, that I'm preaching. The Old Testament couldn't get anybody saved, so it had to be replaced. What was wrong with the Old Testament? Nothing. There was nothing wrong with it. It was finding fault with them. Well, what problem did the Jews have? Same one you have. Don't get high-minded. They had the same problem you had. Same one. And guess what? We got in on the deliverer that was promised to them. Now, and we didn't get in on it because they rejected it. All right? Another dispensational fail right there. We got in on it. It was always God's plan for us to get in on it. So why did what was replacing replacing? Because sinful man can't do what needs to be done. That's why. It was weak because of the flesh. So what was replaced? All right, what was, what was replaced? Well, inter interestingly enough, we find a lot of these things in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to go through these things quickly, all right? All Baptists, believe this right here, all Baptists are going to, will teach what I'm about to teach right now. This is replacement theology, folks, all right? First off, you know what was replaced? The high priest was replaced. It says in Hebrews 7, 5, And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Okay? Jesus Christ he was the better high priest we're going to see later. We see that Abraham, all right, Melchizedek is we're talking about here. He was, he was the better than Abraham. We see a picture here that, you know, the better is, is better. I mean, the word speaks for itself, does it not? And we see that what's been replaced, that high priest, we have a better high priest now. We see uh, their hope. We have a better hope. Hebrews 7, 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did they which draw nigh unto God. We see that there, the, so the high priest was replaced, the hope was replaced, the testament was replaced. Hebrews 7, 22, By so much was Jesus made surety of a better testament. Alright? I'm telling you, I'm glad I'm putting my faith and trust in what Jesus did instead of what I've done. I'm glad I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus' sacrifice than a sacrifice that I have to do. Have you ever read all the details of those sacrifices that they had to do? What if I mess up? What if I miss one? I think what we've got now is better. Would we not all agree? With, I, I, I think all Baptists would agree with that. Why? Why is there something different? Because something was replaced. All right? The New Te Old Testament was replaced with the New Testament. Hebrews 8, 6, we see the covenant. It says, but now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is a mediator of a better 
covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This already happened, folks. I, there's, there's some verses in Hebrews 8 that I love to twist. I'd love to take time to teach all that again. Don't have time. Go listen to my sermon in Hebrews 8. The new covenant already came. It was Jesus Christ. There's not another covenant coming out in the future, Bill Grady. The new covenant already came. And it's a better one. It's a perfect one. It's one that doesn't vanish away. It's one that has a high priest that liveth forever. This covenant cannot be replaced that we have. And it was a covenant that was promised to Israel. And it's the same one that we've been playing. Do we not teach the priesthood of the believer? What do we, why do we say that? Because we don't, need a, we don't need a priest. Why? Because we have direct access to Jesus Christ, our high priest. Well, where did that teaching come from? That's called replacement theology. The high priest got replaced. Do we not all teach that we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore? That Jesus Christ was our sacrifice? Why do we teach that? It's called replacement theology, folks. Jesus replaced the Old Testament sacrifices. Do we not teach that we don't have to keep the Sabbath? So we don't have to keep the feast days? That we don't have to, Why? Because those things got replaced. Jesus fulfilled those things. Jesus replaced that feast of Passover, the feast of unleavened bread. I mean, go read the feast of Passover and unleavened bread, all the details, how meticulous it was. What do we do today? We take a little drink of grape juice and eat a little piece of bread. It's a piece of cake. It's super easy. We do it when we want to do it. We do it for as often as you do it. When, you want, when are we supposed to do it? Whenever you want. Wow. That's pretty easy, isn't it? That's real easy. You know, kind of like how it, it's easy to get saved because Jesus did all the hard stuff. What is that called, my friends? That is called replacement theology. And you got these hypocrites out there bashing this, participating in replacement theology every time they take the Lord's Supper, every time they baptize somebody, every time they claim that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, that he was the sacrifice for sins, they are preaching replacement theology. Why did he do all those things? Because the Old Testament couldn't do it is why he did these things. So notice the sacrifices. Hebrews 9.23, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heavens should be purified with these things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You know what else was replaced? Oh, here we go. Here we go. This will, this will get me kicked off the internet for sure. Their country or their land. Uh-oh. Hebrews 11.13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I love, uh, I, I just, I'm going to have fun with this verse right here. But For they say such things that declare plainly that they seek a country. You know, I, I, got, I just feel like getting sidetracked right now, but I love these people that just want to make a big deal about the land. Israel in the land, Israel in the land, Israel in the land, Bill Grady said. You know, Israel, you know Bill Grady, he brings that dirt to that service. Talking about Israel's going to be married to the dirt. The land of Israel. These guys, they go over, they take their trips to the land of Israel. They kiss the ground. God promised this land to Abraham and his seed. Oh, what a great land it is. And look at the way it's blooming. Look at the beauty of Israel. Just praising the land. Praising the land. One of these days, Israel, you're going to get it back. They go over there, man. They just support Israel. They wave their flag. They tell them that land's for you. We're going to stand with you so you can get this land away from the Palestinians because God promised it to you. God promised it to Abraham. Abraham was looking for this land, but look what it says. Look what it says here. It says, For they that say such things declare that they seek a country, and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire, you see that word again, we see all throughout Hebrews, a better country. That is an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Who's he talking about here in Hebrews 11? He's talking about them from the Old Testament. These bozos, they want to talk about the promises that God gave to Abraham about that land right there. But God said, you know what? Just like I had better sacrifice for you, a better high priest for you, a better everything for you, guess what? I got a better land for you. But they want them to go back and have the crummy land that's over there today. What in the world? Folks, God's got something better. God promised this better thing that was to come to them, to Abraham. They want to get all hung up on this conflict going over there in Palestine. They want to go, they want to go over there, they want to protest that stuff. They want to buy guns for these people and bulletproof vests and flashlights so they can see the Muslims when they're shooting at them better. They want to do all these things for them to help them get this land when God says, you know what, I've got, I've got a better land for you. 
In fact, it's the very land that Abraham was looking for. It's that better country. It's the heavenly country. And they're saying, no, we want, we want them to have the old stuff. Well, that doesn't even do any good. Folks, they're, they're missing the boat. You know what they, these people would do if they love those people over there in Israel? They'd go over there and tell them about the better high priest and the better covenant with the better sacrifices that comes with a better country. Say, so stop saying, oh, worrying about this land over here and why don't you go and you get the country and the land that Abraham was looking for, the one that God promised your father, a better land. But they're getting hung up on that and it is sad, just ignorance. This is New Testament theology right here. This is replacement theology that I'm, talk, that I'm talking about. So verse 39 of Hebrews 11 says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be perfect. Yeah, look, folks, there's, there's a lot of promises that we see there in the Old Testament. There's a lot of promises. But you all realize what God ended up providing what God ended up replacing is better. And they're all hung up on the old promises okay? that God fulfilled, but in a better way. Right? God ended up having something better, a land, a, a heavenly country. So the blood of lambs was replaced by the blood of Jesus, Hebrews 12, 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. The blood that Jesus shed was better than the lamb that Abel slew. It was better. Jesus replaced it. God replaced it. This is replacement theology. Every preacher who rejects replacement theology is a hypocrite. They are either a hypocrite or they are just ignorant. They are ignorant of true replacement theology. And they are two-faced in their interpretation of the scriptures. These false prophets, these sons of Schofield... That want to go and pro they they have replaced Jesus Christ with the Antichrist Jews is what they've done with the synagogue of Satan they have replaced Jesus Christ with the Antichrist Jews I, I wish I had time to go through Galatians chapter three go but go ahead and turn over there real quick I just need to slap them in the face with Galatians chapter three and four the most ignored passages in the Bible because they just scream replacement theology says in verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And God, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. And that's not us getting blessed because we gave money to the Jews. Jesus Christ was that blessing. What was the blessing of Jesus Christ? The fact that we could be saved. That's what it was. So then they which are be of faith, are blessed with faithful Abraham. You know, when I was a little kid, I was, I was six or seven years old. It was when we lived in Spring Valley. We were having de devotions. We are going through the book of Genesis. My dad read that passage where it said, I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And I remember my dad read that verse and I asked him, I said, Dad, do you think we descend from Abraham? That's what I asked him because we're blessed. I felt like we're probably descendants of Abraham. Because we're blessed. And I ended up learning that no, he was Jew. We come from Japheth. We're Gentiles. And it was disappointing. I was, I was, I was always so, I was like, man, I thought for sure we've got to be descendants of Abraham because we're so blessed. You know, and it took, it's, I'm, it's sad to say, you know, almost 30 years later, I found out I was right. <laughs> I was absolutely right. I do descend from Abraham, not physically, but spiritually. I am a child of Abraham, according to Galatians. I, that's what, folks, this is kindergarten. This is kindergarten stuff that I'm teaching right here. All right, the, the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Look what it says in verse 10. For as many of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Curses everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law on the side of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Look at verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Why do they keep saying, you know, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee? 
and still keep applying it to the Jews. It says the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. How could that be? How could that come on us unless it doesn't matter who you come from physically, but it matters where you come from spiritually. And you come through Christ spiritually by faith in him. Look at verse um, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed of God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Folks, people keep saying that land belongs to Israel because God gave it to them by promise. Okay, I agree with that. So why are you calling those people over there who deny Christ the children of Abraham when the Bible doesn't? Well, they're the ones who descend from him physically. Oh, okay, so they're his children by the law? Is that what you're... I, that, that's what they're saying, folks. But the Bible says, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. Folks, the land belongs to Israel by promise, not by the law, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serve the law? It was added because of transgression of the seed should come, whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Uh, look at verse, let's jump down to verse 20. Oh, we'll keep reading. And, and the law is made against the promises of God. God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's everybody once again, folks. We're all in the same boat. Verse 26, for you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So folks, it is very clear, it is very clear that, you know, we are the children of Abraham. Yes, sir. Amen. And they are not. The Bible specifically, explicitly says that they are not. They're only, the Zionists, their only claim that they have that that land belongs to them is that they descend from Abraham physically. Then that would make them children by the law. If it's their children of the law, the promise is of none effect. Folks, I want those people over there. I want them to get the land. I want them to get claim the promise, but they're going to have to get saved first. They're going to have to accept Jesus Christ. If they don't, they're not going to get it. So lastly, what is replacement theology? Quickly, I'm going to try to go through this. It is the teaching that the New Testament replaced the Old Testament. That's what it is. It's a teaching that the law condemned man because he was sinful, but yet God still loved us and he sent Jesus to replace us on the cross. Amen. It's the teaching that the promises of God can be obtained through faith instead of by the law. It's a teaching that we're no longer Jew and Gentile because both in Gen Jews and Gentiles failed miserably. Both failed horribly. But instead, you know what? I don't have to worry about being a Jew or a Gentile. You know what? I'll just be in Christ. You know what? I'll just trust in Jesus Christ and then I'm good. Then I'm covered. Then I can be the real Jew. One who is in Christ. Because he is not a Jew that was one outwardly. Yeah, we are a real Jew by being in Christ. We can be the real Israel. So what about the Israel? And most Baptists, I think they'd agree with that. I think they have to agree with that. So what about the Israel of today? Well, first off, they're not Israel. Romans 2 made that real clear. They are the synagogue of Satan. Revelation makes that clear. 1 John makes that clear. 2 John makes that clear. Get ready to get smacked in the face with 2 John. You stinking hypocrites out there. You know, what are they are counterfeit? They are antichrist. And God's not done <laughs> with the physical Israel. You know why? You know why God's not done with Israel? Physical Israel? Because God sent a deliverer 2000 years ago who paid for their sins. And they can still be saved if they will call on Christ. They're not reprobate. Any individual of them can still be saved if they'll believe on Christ. If they do not, they will go to hell just like everyone else. I know that's anti-Semitic to say they're just like everybody else once again, but they, they are. Okay? There are promises concerning the land that are to be fulfilled. Okay? I believe they're going to be fulfilled with a better country. That God actually promised the one that Abraham actually looked for. I also believe that they will be fulfilled in the millennium. 
But those promises are going to be fulfilled to the ones who God actually promised them to. He promised those to those who are of faith. He promised them to those Old Testament saints that are dead and in the grave right now. But guess what? Ezekiel 37 makes it clear there's going to be a resurrection from the dead. Not a forming of a state of Israel in 1948. Folks, they're going to rise from the dead at the rapture. And those who God actually made those promises to are going to receive that inheritance. But folks, the country is going to be a whole lot better than it is right now. It's a mess right now. It's got walls all over the place right now. There's war all over the place right now. But one of these days, there's not going to be any walls in the millennium. There's going to be peace there in the millennium. And who's going to get to enjoy that? Not these bozos over there denying Jesus Christ. Not these haters of God that are over there right now. It's going to be those who are of faith. It's going to be those from the Old Testament that are going to rise from the dead that God actually promised to. It's going to be Abraham. It's going to be Moses. It's going to be David and Solomon and people like that. Those things will be fulfilled in the millennium. 1948 was a counterfeit. That was not the fulfillment. And they're always talking about these end times prophecies. Like these things in the Old Testament, like, like Israel without any walls. Israel is currently building walls everywhere. How in the world is what you're seeing there in the Old Testament that prophecy being fulfilled. Now, folks, that's not going to happen. They're, they're going to keep building walls until Jesus takes over that place. Those things aren't going to be fulfilled until the millennium. What we're seeing right here is not the fulfillment of those prophecies. It's a fraud. These people are deceived. And so, but there are things that are going to come, but they're going to come to, to those who are the children of Abraham by promise. And that's us. I'm sorry. Galatians 4.28 is really clear. We, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. So, uh, look, turn over to 2 John. All right, well, I'll get to that one here real quick. So, here, here's, and this is just bonus, all right? This is bonus right here. But, you know, every preacher who rejects replacement theology, once again, is a hypocrite. They are, they are two-faced. And there are, it's high time that they get their theology together and they start practicing what they preach. And you know what? I, from now on, every church who rejects replacement theology, I'm calling on them to throw out certain songs, like how about all hail the power of Jesus' name that we sang earlier. It says, ye chosen seed of Israel's race. Okay, now we don't get our theology from the hymn books like a lot of people do. But you know what? We like it when our hymn book matches what the Bible teaches. And in this case, you chose the seed of Israel's race. I believe that applies. I believe that's right. These people don't think we are of Israel's race. You know what? They need to throw that song out. They need to throw out when the roll is called up yonder, when it says, when his chosen one shall gather, gather. That's the word we should be using instead of rapture. That's not in the Bible. When his chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the sky. Well, if we're not the chosen ones, why are we singing when his chosen one shall gather? Why are we singing about the Jews' rapture? And then saying, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Well, when his chosen one shall gather, that's the Jews' rapture. When the roll is called up yonder, that's our rapture. So which one are you going to be there for? Both of them, because ours comes first, and we'll still be up there when the Jews come too, right? Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with that. They need to do some rewriting of that song if they're going to do it. They need to stop singing, come and dine. What does it say? He invites his chosen people. Come and dine. You know what else they need to do? They need to stop singing it as well with my soul. They need to stop singing their favorite verse at the end when it says, And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord shall descend. The, tr the clouds being rolled back in a sc as a scroll is in Revelation chapter 6. That happens after the sun is darkened and the moon is turned to blood, which Matthew 24 says is after the tribulation of those days. Which they would say, well, that's the Jewish rapture. So why are you singing about your rap, the Jewish rapture again in Israel of my soul? Why are you so excited about that day? You know, when you know, it has nothing to do with you because you're not a Jew. You know, these, these people are hypocrites. Get rid of it. They need to stop singing nothing but the blood. They need to start singing, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood, unless you're a Jew. Because Jesus is going to save them when he just shows back up. He's just going to save them for nothing. No. They, they're, be, they're being hypocrites. These All dispensations need to stop singing yesterday, today, and forever. 
And then for the final just bonus that I shared in Sunday school today, that I just I just learned this last night. <clears throat> Turn over to 2 John. Every preacher who rejects replacement theology, who has used this verse to tell, teach their people to reject Jehovah's Witnesses and to be rude to Jehovah's Witnesses and to run off Jehovah's Witness is a two-faced hypocrite. Now, folks, I have used this verse to prove we should run off Jehovah's Witnesses, and I think it's still appropriate. All right? But you all know what it is in 2 John, only one chapter there. I'm, I'm in the wrong. I'm in 1 John. Look at what it says in verse 10. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, not this doctrine, which doctrine? It's a good question. The Bible says, receive him not in your house, neither bid him God speed. If you do, you're a partaker of their evil deeds. Ah, lock that. Let's get them Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, here's the problem. There weren't any Jehovah's Witnesses in John's day. But you know what? There was a group in John's day there was a specific group who was saying that Jesus wasn't the Messiah or the Christ. Look what it says in verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Who was saying that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh? It was all over 1 John. It was the Jews. They were the ones who said he wasn't the Messiah. Look to yourselves that we lose not the things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Who claims to have the Father, but they reject the Son? It's the Jews. The Jews are the ones who do that. And what does he say? He's telling them to abide in that doctrine. Don't let those people, don't let the Jews deceive you on this. And he says, what did he say? And if they're coming... Come any unto you, bring and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. What are these bozos doing over their day? They are going over, they are taking money to Israel, they are blessing Israel, they are going to jewelry stores and going to these Jews and thanking them for giving us the Bible, thanking them for giving us the Messiah, telling them we pray for you, we love you. You know, we want to be a blessing to you. We're going to buy you guns. We're going to buy you bulletproof vests over there in Israel. And these people reject that Jesus is the Christ. They reject that Christ has come in the flesh. Christ, the Messiah. They reject that the Messiah has come. The people who are teaching the very doctrine that John said, don't bid, let him come into your house. Don't bid him Godspeed. If you do, you're partaker of their evil deeds. And let me tell you, that wicked group that's over there killing Palestinians and these Baptist churches that are supporting these people, that are praising them, are partakers of their evil deeds. They're helping kill. Yeah, it's another group of wicked people, but you know what? It's still murder. It's still wicked. And you know what? They're phonies and they're two-faced and they're hypocrites when they use 2 John and they tell you to follow that with Jehovah's Witnesses. But then they, say, they turn around and they say, now don't you dare say anything against the Jews. You say anything against the Jews, God's hand is going to be against you. He's going to come down on you. You're going to lose the blessing of God. Don't be surprised when you lose your job and when you, have, you, you end up sick and in the hospital because you were saying things against the Jews. You don't say something against the people of God. The Bible says they're not the people of God. The Bible says not to be a blessing to those who reject that Jesus is, not, uh, that reject that Jesus is the Christ, and yet they are teaching opposite. Why? I'll tell you why. Because a group of good people... A group of Baptists who had some good doctrine, you know what they did? They let some leaven come in. They let Schofield come in, people like him, and bring in this wicked doctrine of Zionism, and they have embraced it, and they have loved it to the point where they've let it change the doctrine of end times. They've let it change the teaching on the rapture, and they are even in many cases, not in all cases yet, but give it time. The people who continue to hang on to this dispensational garbage, this Zionist garbage, will eventually all just be dispensational salvation. Faith plus works in the Old Testament. Faith plus works in the New Testament. And when folks, when they're at that point, they're not saved anymore. Anyone who understands salvation, anyone who is saved understands that no one ever could get saved by the law because the Bible says that. And no one ever will get saved by the law. God is not going to go back to an Old Testament economy that didn't even work in the first place when he already provided something better. We have an Old and a New Testament. The Old Testament was replaced by the New Testament. And the Old Testament's not coming back. And God gave us better things. God replaced those things. 
And many of these things we've talked about tonight are pre it's pre it's being preached right now across Baptist churches throughout this country yet at the same time they're going to go and in these same churches they will bash people like me for what we teach. They can't refute it. They can't accurately represent it, but they're they're going to bash it anyway. Why? Because their popes told them to. Their Bible colleges told them you're supposed to be dispensational. Well, I don't really understand dispensational. Yeah, yeah but you know, I, I, fine, fine. I'm, they they want to be popular. They want the praise of men. They want to be accepted. And folks, it's a lie. And the they've they've taken this thing way too far. It's got it's gotten out of hand. They have been challenged, folks. The word is out. They are accountable. Zionism is a fraud. It is a lie, and it is. High time we get back to biblical Christianity. Amen. Replacement theology. Old Testament. It's gone. The New Testament has entered. We have a better high priest, and he's not going anywhere, folks. This covenant is going to hang around until our high priest is no longer around, and our high priest isn't going anywhere. He's not going to die again. We are in this covenant it, it will end when Jesus ends, and he will not end. Down with Zionism. Down with this dispensational garbage. It is high time these people repent, and it, they get back to biblical New Testament Christianity. And that, my friends, is replacement theology. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word, Lord. I pray that... This message came across in the right spirit, Lord. It's hard not to get fired up when you, you think about just the simple truths that are just being cast to the wayside, Lord, so people can just hang on to a, pol a political, be a part of a political movement that's of this world and that's of the devil. And dear God, I pray you'll just wake people out of their sleep and help them to get back to just basic biblical New Testament Christianity. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's go.